This is Ask GMBN Tech, our weekly tech Q&A session. If you've got any questions you love to ask us, get involved in the comments section underneath and use the hashtag Ask GMBN Tech. Alternatively, you can email them to hellotech at gmbn.com. Thanks for a great channel. I've got a question regarding brake pads. I'm rather clear on the characteristics of the organic, semi-metallic and metallic versions, but what about Kevlar disc pads? Any experience? Um, where would you put them in comparison to the other three? Um, that's quite interesting actually, we were talking about Kevlar pads the other day. Now I'm pretty guilty of not ridden Kevlar pads myself and actually I tend to default to uh, sintered pads mainly because we ride in pretty horrific conditions and although they're not always the best in wet cold damp conditions because they do need to heat up to work their best, they resist wearing out um, compared to other brake pads like semi-metallics or organics and resin. But something I really do not like about using sintered all year round um, is those rides when they don't get heated up. You're not using the brakes that much, maybe an undulating ride in wet conditions and they can howl like a banshee regardless of being bedded in correctly. So on paper, really, I think semi-metallic is probably best for me. But um, no, Kevlar pads. So this is the thing with Kevlar pads. Generally the pad material is softer, but they have Kevlar strands in them to help them resist wearing down too far. So kind of, you should get the best of both worlds. Now in theory, the soft pads on there should bite really well in a variety of conditions, but those Kevlar pads, uh, the Kevlar strands even, will help them resist wearing out. But I hear from friends that use them, and I do have friends using various different brand ones, so this isn't always gonna be the same, that they can be really noisy when it's wet, especially when it's cold and wet out. Um, those sort of rides, like I just described, those undulating rides when they don't get enough heat into them. Uh, and also that they can wear your rotors down a little bit quicker than perhaps a normal, like a resin or an organic pad would. Uh, and the reason for that is Kevlar material itself is very hard. So just like you would monitor the rims on an old bike with rim brakes, you wanna feel them with your nails just for wear, just monitor your disc rotors if you're gonna be using those. But no, in truth, I've not ridden Kevlar pads. I'd quite like to, quite like to try them just to see what they're like in a variety of conditions. Uh, definitely keen to know from any other GMBN tech fans out there, anyone ridden Kevlar pads? Do you rate them? Do they work well in the dry? Do they work well in the wet? Anything you can offer to help us out, let us know in those comments. And in the meantime, I'm gonna try and order some and give them a try myself. Next time's wheel related from Phil Rossetti. Doddy, loving the show. I've just got a pair of asymmetrical rims from my sponsor and I'm gonna be lacing them onto some halo hubs. I'm struggling to understand if the spoke lengths will be affected by the offset. Please help me. Uh, do you also think I'll be able to run the same length spoke on drive a non drive side hub? Uh, hub flanges are the same height. Phil, cheers for that. Um, yeah, so having uh, an asymmetrical rim or offset uh, spoke drillings can make for a stronger wheel. Of course, the strongest wheels are always going to be ones that are built correctly in the first place and are tensioned equally with the correct length spokes. Now spoke length does vary immensely, even on the same size wheel with similar hubs. Now the height of the flanges won't make too much difference. The distance between the flanges makes a bigger difference and the distance of the flanges from the outside, uh, obviously there's going to be slightly more inboard on the drive side and slightly less on the disc side. Uh, they all play a big part in how basically the bracing angle of the wheel is going to affect how long the spokes are. Um, makes a big difference. And of course, your asymmetrical rim, has it got offset holes drilled in there? Are they offset from each other? Like there's a lot of different factors to take into account. The best thing you wanna do is either go old school and get a formula for building a wheel, in which case you can go to Sheldon Brown's amazing, useful website. There's a huge resource of information and they've got the, the formula there. You need to work out um, your measurements. To do that, you can need some digital calipers or veneers to measure the distance between your hubs, the size, um, size of your flanges, distance between them from the outside measurement, all that sort of stuff. And it will be able to calculate the length of spoke down to one millimeter length there. Um, and make sure you get it right. But if you're unsure about that, I'm just gonna throw you to a page, it's prowheelbuilder.com. Now, this particular page I've got here is the calculator. So you basically put your input into this, your selection of rim, your selection of hub, how many spokes you've got, if you're gonna lace it two cross, three cross, four cross, and it varies with each one of those. I'm sure you're gonna know about that stuff, judging by the fact that you've, you're even talking about this in the first place. But if you don't know about it, it's a great website. And if it doesn't have your particular rim or hub listed, you can do those measurements yourself with your digital calipers and input them and still use that to give you a formula to calculate your spoke length. Uh, it's really accurate as well. I've used this several times over the years. I'm gonna put a link to that in the description below. Uh, let us know how you get on, good luck. 
Okay, Josh Reardon wants to know about rear derailleur. So he's got a high bike downhill pro running a Shimano Saint drivetrain with a short cage rear derailleur. Can I fit a 42 tooth first gear cassette? Um, well, firstly, nice choice in bike. Secondly, I don't think you can. Um, if I'm right in thinking your Saint rear derailleur on there will be 10 speed, in which case the compatibility, the maximum sprocket size on the back will be 36 tooth. Now that's a tiny derailleur, um, so I think you're stuck with that unfortunately, or it's upgrading the derailleur. Now if you had a medium cage, you can be up to changing things around a bit because the throw of the derailleur is open to a bit more and you can get different lower cage. Uh, people like Wolftooth make a conversion kit which has the longer jockey cage spacing on the bottom there. They also make a little conversion which lowers the height of where your rear derailleur is mounted. Um, basically, so it makes it handle a little bit more like a longer cage derailleur, but in your case with a short, it's not gonna work. So it may well be able to offer the capacity to get up onto the 42 tooth, but because of the fact your short cage is so short, it's not gonna actually take the tension on the chain correctly. You're gonna be left with a baggy chain at the opposite end when you're in the high gear. So that's the reason for needing a longer cage, is basically to take up the slack in the chain, because you're gonna need more chain to get onto a bigger gear. So I think it's time for a new derailleur for you if you wanna to upgrade to that. Okay, this one's from Wolf MTB. Very strange question, this one. My rear brake is squeaking like a potato. Um, I have no idea what that means. I've never heard a potato squeak. However, um, squeaking brakes are a pain in the ass. So I've already cleaned it. I've used some sandpaper to make sure the pads are not glassed. They're organic. Um, also on the disc itself, but it doesn't stop. My pistons have some rust on them, I guess from, from old pads. Any advice? Could the spokes be a reason? Because when I pull the brake on my bike sand, I feel the spokes vibrating but my wheels got a little bit out of true with a wobble to the right. The disc bolts are tight and the brakes are SRAM guides 2016, if you think it's relevant. Um, all right, so you've done the major things. Uh, with regards to the rust, it depends how bad the rust is. To me, it's probably just surface rust, in which case you get rid of that with some wire wool. Um, as with all braking surfaces, make sure you use some sort of isopropyl alcohol afterwards before putting the pads um, back in there, but I don't think the rust is anything to do with the brake squealing. Now brakes only tend to squeal, it's basically an oscillation of the brake pad, so super fine vibration creates howling and squealing. So if you've bedded in your brakes correctly in the first place, i.e. there's decent amount of brake pad material deposited on the rotors, and it's an even spacing on there, they shouldn't squeak. If they're not glassed over, they shouldn't squeak either. So. It, you could be unlucky, they might be contaminated. That is something that happens. Now with the vibration you're talking about through the spokes, that is something that can cause problems. But it doesn't always tend to be through the spokes, it tends to be through the frames. Now I was checking out G. Atherton's bike a couple of years ago out at Whistler. Now he had a vibration damper fitted to his rear brake caliper. Now his particular brake would squeak and squeal under certain um, under certain conditions, basically when he's using the brake and he's absolutely flat out the whole time, there would be a particular type of vibration that they couldn't quite place, transmitted somewhere through the frame. It could be because his wheels were immensely stiff or it could be a suspension setup thing. The point is there was some vibration occurring through the frame and it was vibrating at the caliper which he could feel through the brake and that would also transmit into the form of squealing. So it does prove to the point that sometimes you can be prone to this. And if that's the case of yours, then that's really unlucky. So basically the last thing I would do, uh, re-true up your wheel, make sure your dropouts are tight on the bike frame itself if they've got any bolts. Make sure your either your quick release axle or your bolt through axle is tight. Make sure all of the obvious things are tight. Make sure the caliper is tight itself. Um, and really, I mean, maybe new brake pads and new disc rotor is the way to go if you've still got this problem. Brakes generally shouldn't squeal that bad once they're bedded in properly, and if you've had to clean them at all, it might be a case of there not being enough braking pad material on that disc rotor, because that fundamentally is what gives you a good braking surface. If the rotor itself is too clean, then it's not gonna be doing its job. Scar it up with some sandpaper and start that bedding in process. There we go, there's another weekly Ask GMBN Tech in the bag. If you've got any questions, let us know in those comments. 
Um, don't forget to use the hashtag AskGMBNTech if you've got any questions specifically for the show to go on next week's show. And if you want to see a couple of great videos, click down here for my sort of Pandora's box of cool kit that I like to have in addition to my toolkit. And click down here if you want to see Blake's bike um, that the crazy nutter raced the Valparaiso Urban Downhill on. As always, don't forget to give us a huge thumbs up if you love GMBN Tech, and don't forget to subscribe and share.